the honor of introducing our speaker this afternoon, Mrs. Deborah Larson. Deborah is a third generation resident of the Rochester area and currently resides in Rochester Hill with her husband. She holds a BA in history from Oakland University and a master's degree in library science from Western Michigan University. She served for 34 years as the local history librarian at Mount Clemens Public Library and retired as the library's assistant director in 2018. She is the research chairperson for the Rochester Avon Historical Society and is a past member of the board of directors of the Macomb County Historical Society and, is a mem and, as, and was a member of the City of Rochester Historical Commission. She has written several books on local history, including Hometown Rochester and Legendary Locals of Mount Clemens. I first became a fan of her work while reading all of her historical articles and snippets in our local newspapers, so I'm just thrilled to meet her today. So here to talk about the very timely topic of the history of the RCS administration building is Mrs. Deborah Larson with Tower Falls. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. I am really happy to be here today to talk about this very timely topic. We don't have any falcons in the room, come on. For those of you in the room who were not fortunate enough to attend Rochester High School, that was the Rochester High School alma mater, played by Rochester's first and finest, the Falcon Marching Band. <laughs> to start our story, we need to turn the pages of history back almost two centuries. As soon as other families joined the Grahams to create a permanent settlement at Rochester, the need for public education emerged. During Rochester's early pioneer era, settlers taught the school-aged children in their homes. Eleven years after the Grahams settled here, the townspeople built a small schoolhouse on Pine Street near the location of the former Congregational Church, and that school later moved to Walnut Street. But public education took, whoa, there we go. Public education took uh, a, a major change in 1829. It was pretty loosely organized until then, but at that time the territorial legislature passed a law that required each township to elect school commissioners. It was the duty of these commissioners to divide their respective townships into numbered school districts. And on this map, you can see the various school districts of Avon Township denoted by different color blocks. Let's see here. They started in the northeast corner with district number one, Stony Creek, and then district number two followed that down the eastern border of the township and then district number three, which became known as the Brooklyn's district, district number four, the Hamlin district, and then we got to the village of Rochester, which is this green square right here, and that plus a few outlying farms that were adjacent to the village borders became known as Avon number five. So everything that's uh, surrounded by this magenta line comprised Avon school district number five. As the number of school children increased in Avon, classes were moved to a church building for a while and eventually they built a larger schoolhouse. But the village's school offered primary education only. So in 1845, a group of private citizens got together and formed a private academy funded by subscription that would offer high school instruction. In March, 
1847, this school, which was named the Lyceum of Avon, purchased land on a rise of ground west of the village center at the corner of what we know today as 4th and Wilcox Streets. Here the Lyceum began construction of a framed school building. The new schoolhouse was informally called the Rochester Academy and it was dedicated in October 1847. The Academy name stuck and the school grounds were known locally for decades thereafter as Academy Hill. No photos or images of the Lyceum building are known to exist. However, history does record some clues as to what it looked like. First of all, according to this plat map drawn in 1872 while the Lyceum building was still standing and being used on Academy Hill, we can see that it had a rectangular footprint and it was located a little bit closer to the corner of 4th and Wilcox than the old building that we call the Harrison Building stands today. That, uh, the Harrison Building would be more about right here. So the Lyceum building stood a little bit to its west. We also know from a comment published in the newspaper by a former student of the Lyceum um, that it was very similar to the Disco Academy, which was a contemporary of the Rochester Academy over in Shelby Township. And this student said the two buildings looked pretty much the same, although the Rochester building was slightly larger. And we also know from school board minutes that the building had two, was two stories high, it had a belfry, and it could seat about 250 students. So here on the left is a photo of the Disco Academy taken around 1855. That's from the uh, collection of the Shelby Township Historical Committee. And we can infer from the clues that I just mentioned that our Lyceum of Avon building probably looked pretty much like this. Also on this slide, you can see an account of the dedication of the Lyceum of Avon. And this is from a Pontiac newspaper because Rochester had none at the time. And the account says in part, quote, the good people of Avon have recently erected a noble building on the eminence westward, which overlooks the village of Rochester for academical purposes. And it would be difficult to point out in all this region of country a finer location for such an institution, end quote. The story goes on to describe a dedication ceremony that involved a community procession led by the Rochester Brass Band, some speeches, and some selections by the town choir. The article concludes with these words, the academy must reach a place of eminence amongst the literary institutions of our state. Success attend them. Well, success most certainly did attend several of the people who were associated with the Lyceum of Avon, either as teachers or as students. I have some photos or images of a few of them here. On the top line at left is probably one of the most uh, noteworthy people who was associated with the Lyceum as a teacher, and that is Antoinette Brown Blackwell, top left there. She came to Rochester as a young woman to teach at the academy, and she was working as a school teacher to fund her studies at Ohio's Oberlin College. She joined schoolmaster Peter Moyers as a teacher at the Lyceum of Avon in the fall of 1846. Later in life, Brown Blackwell would become the first woman in the United States to be ordained a minister by a mainline Christian denomination and she was a tireless national advocate for women's rights and women's suffrage. Brown Blackwell was also a lifelong friend of fellow women's rights crusader Lucy Stone, who would later become her sister-in-law, and she was also the sister-in-law of Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman in America to receive a medical degree. From here in Rochester, Antoinette wrote in her letters to Lucy Stone that she enjoyed her time at the Lyceum of Avon, but she had found that teaching was not her calling in life. Now, we don't know the extent to which her experience with students in Rochester led to that epiphany, but in any event, in the spring of 1847, she returned to Oberlin, and from there she went on to make her mark on American history as a minister and as a crusader for women's suffrage. Uh, there's an interesting aside for me. 
just a couple of years ago, we celebrated the uh, 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment and the 100th anniversary of the 1920 presidential election, which was the first one after the passage of women's suffrage. And it just so happens that during the election of 1920, a now 95-year-old Antoinette Brown Blackwell cast her first and only ballot for President of the United States. And I have to wonder how her career would have played out had not her experience at the Lyceum of Avon convinced her that she wasn't meant to be a school teacher. Top center is another schoolmaster that we had at the Lyceum of Avon. This is Robert Clark Kedzie. When schoolmaster Moyers died right after the new Lyceum building was dedicated, he was replaced by Kedzie, who was also a graduate of Oberlin College. Now Kedzie, uh, when he left Rochester, went to join the first medical class at the University of Michigan Medical School. And after earning his medical degree, he started a 37-year degree uh, tenure as a professor of chemistry at Michigan Agriculture College, now MSU. He also served as president of Michigan State Board of Health and was published widely in periodical literature on matters relating to public health. And if you're interested in his career, Google Shadows from the Walls of Death, a book that he published, which is very interesting. There are lots and lots of articles out there about it. It's a fascinating story. A third notable school teacher at the Lyceum was the final one, the top uh, row right, and that is Kelvin Harlow Green. Green was a self-taught literary scholar and devotee of the Transcendentalist movement, and he was most noted for his correspondence with Henry David Thoreau and for commissioning what is to believed to have been the first portrait image of Thoreau ever made. Thoreau scholars of today acknowledge a debt of gratitude to Calvin Green for the creation of what they call the Maxim daguerreotype image of Thoreau, which has now been enshrined in the National Portrait Gallery. On the bottom row here, we have some students of the Lyceum of Avon who made good. On the left, we have Jay Hubble. After the Lyceum, he went to the University of Michigan and he was admitted to the Michigan Bar in 1855. He served in Washington as a congressman for Michigan for 10 years and then returned to the state to serve three years in the Michigan Senate. Perhaps his greatest legacy is that he convinced the state legislature to establish a school of mining, which we know today as Michigan Technological University, and Hubble himself donated the land for the school's first buildings in 1885. At bottom center, we have the Honorable Edward Wright Harris. He's the brother of Sam Harris, the man who donated the granite fountain to the village of Rochester. But Edward Wright Harris followed his father's footsteps and became a lawyer. And he served many years as a judge of the St. Clair County Circuit Court and presided over some very high profile Michigan cases during his career. Bottom right is Major Lyman G. Wilcox, who served as an officer in command of the 3rd Michigan Cavalry during the Civil War. After the war, he had a varied career in journalism for several newspapers and was most notably the editor of the Bay City Tribune. He was also an attorney and was appointed to several government posts during his lifetime. The Lyceum of Avon was dissolved by its trustees in 1857. Since no records appear to have survived, we don't know why this was. But in any event, the trustees sold the schoolhouse and their property on Academy Hill to Avon School District No. 5 in March of 1857. The public school district then abandoned their inferior school building down on Walnut Street transferred all of their school activities up to the former Lyceum building on Academy Hill, and all the students in the village began going to school there. At the same time, the school board decided to make some major changes. They divided students into upper and lower grade departments, established a high school course of study for the first time, and began hiring credentialed teachers. This reorganization was a huge step and a huge advancement for education in the village. The process of standing up a high school program took a few years, but finally in 1882, Rochester High School granted its first diplomas 
to a graduating class of four students. But by the time the high school held that first commencement exercise, there was great dissatisfaction growing with the school building. The Lyceum building was now 40 years old. It was becoming very overcrowded and somewhat decrepit. And so in regular intervals, we start to see these complaints popping up in the newspapers about the school. What are we going to do about the condition of the schoolhouse? And this first one here was uh, a very prescient one that was published in 1885 and said, the old academy will stand on the hill until a welcome fire or tornado destroys it. And a little over three years after that letter was published, its prophecy was fulfilled. On August 6, 1888, a suspected arson fire destroyed the wooden schoolhouse formerly known as the Lyceum Building. The fire flashed up quickly and the odor of kerosene was in the air, so although nobody was ever charged with a crime, the origin was fairly apparent. If the fire was started by a student who didn't want his summer vacation to end, he was sorely disappointed. The school board quickly arranged for upper grade classes to be held at the Avon Township Hall at 4th and Pine Street, while the lower grades were moved to the Adventist Church Building on Oak Street. Meanwhile, the board solicited plans from architects for either a two-story brick building with basement capable of seating 350 pupils or a one-story brick building to seat 175 pupils. The Rochester era weighed in with a go big or stay home editorial encouraging the voters not to cheap out on the new school. And the paper said, quote, let us be united in calling for a structure that shall not only honor our judgments, but will at least place us upon a level with our sister towns in this respect. We do not want a cheap schoolhouse in the common acceptance of that term, but we want one to which we can point with feelings of pride and satisfaction. Voters passed a bond issue to raise $8,000 for the construction of a new school, and the plan submitted by architect Claire Allen, then of Lansing, Michigan, for a two-story brick schoolhouse with basement was adopted. Architect Claire Allen was born in Pontiac, Michigan in 1853 and began his career as a carpenter and building contractor in Ionia County. He was entirely self-taught in the field of architectural design. His design for Avon School District No. 5 was one of his earliest commissions, along with that of the Lake Odessa Railroad Depot completed in 1888. He moved to Jackson in 1890, where his design work broadened to include office buildings, churches, schools, and libraries, and he gained a reputation as a sought-after regional architect. He designed five Michigan County courthouses and many high-end residences in Jackson. Allen was active as an architect almost until his death in 1942 at the age of 89. Several of his buildings are on the National Register of Historic Places or the Michigan Register of Historic Sites, and I've listed some of those for you. The top six are National Register and the rest are Michigan State Register. Allen's design for Avon No. 5 was a two-story brick building with some Richardsonian design elements such as these arched windows and doors. It had three large rooms on each floor and the second floor of the bell tower served as the principal's office and the school board meeting room. The building welcomed students for the first time in the fall of 1889 and it was formally dedicated in October of that year. And I put the Sanborn uh, map footprint of the building here and I kind of rotated it so that it matched the picture, the bell tower being right here and this building, this wall matching this wall, that wall matching that wall. So you can see three large rooms on each floor and central staircase right there. When the schoolhouse was just eight years old, in October of 1897, the school board purchased the land adjoining the school grounds to the north with an eye toward expanding the building to relieve the overcrowding that was already becoming apparent. If you remember on the previous slide that we looked at with the plat map, the school grounds went two-thirds of the way from 4th Street to 5th Street, and this new property purchase in 1897 meant that they had everything from 4th to 5th Street, or University Drive, if you 
don't know what I mean by Fifth Street. So the needed addition to the building um, was not going to go on the new property. It was going to be added to the existing building, but it didn't happen for another decade. In May of 1907, the school board finally advertised for bids for an addition to the school. And this uh, addition was made from plans by architects Malcolmson and Higginbotham of Detroit. The firm of Malkinson and Higginbotham designed the vast majority of Detroit's public school buildings from 1894 until 1923. Schools designed by the firm can also be found across Michigan. Rochester carpenter and builder James Stackhouse won the build, uh, bid for the school addition and the work was completed in just a few months. High school classes were relocated to the new wing, opening the entire second floor of the original schoolhouse for primary grades. Now on this photo, the new wing is this portion right here that has, looks like the brick is a little bit lighter color. And if you refer to the Sanborn map, this piece right here is the original school and this is the 1907 addition on the north end of the building, which is that part right there. The still growing student population, uh, however, made this completely inadequate. It was inadequate to meet the demand almost from day one. It's important to look back at what was happening in Rochester at that time. The turn of the 20th century brought the interurban line, meaning that a third rail line now connected Rochester to the larger cities of Michigan with an affordable fare. The interurban line, when it came, also built a powerhouse that generated power for its entire Flint division and a car barn. These facilities brought employment opportunities and new workers into Rochester. So did the brand new Western Knitting Mills factory, which had just been built in 1896 and was destined to become Rochester's largest employer at one point. Add to that the Detroit Sugar Factory that opened in 1899 on uh, Woodward Street and Rochester's booming. Workers were in demand, there was more family housing being built, and when you have more family housing being built, you need more school capacity. In the 10 year interval between the 1890 and 1900 federal censuses, the village of Rochester saw a 71% increase in population. And Avon weighed in with a not too shabby 33% increase in population. So it's hard to imagine what the school board was thinking when they did this, but this came back to bite them right away because only nine years after that addition opened, there were 523 students crammed into this building. So the still growing student population led the school board to seek funding for a construction of another building in 1913. Now this time they weren't going to add on, but they were talking about, do we build a new high school building or and leave the elementary kids here, or do we build a new elementary school and leave the high school kids in this building? And they flip-flopped back and forth on this for about two years, and because of the indecision, they could never get a bond issue passed. Every time they brought it up, it got shot down. Finally, in October 1915, everybody agreed, we're gonna build a new high school at the corner of Fifth and Wilcox, and we're gonna pay for it. So they passed the bond issue, and the new high school went up on the corner of Fifth and Wilcox. If you look at the Sanborn map over on the left, you can see that the old building, the 1889 Allen Building with its addition is still over here on 4th Street, and up here on 5th Street we have the new high school, and there's lots of room in between here. This building was designed by Fisher Brothers, architecture firm of Pontiac, Michigan, with a cost of a little over $21,000. The architects, William J. Fisher and Charles A. Fisher, were born in Pontiac. Both brothers earned their degrees from the University of Michigan, and they founded an architecture and engineering partnership in Pontiac in 1895. They also built Pontiac's Rapid Motor Vehicle Company, the 1922 Oxford Savings Bank, and many public schools, business blocks, and residences across Oakland County. Here in Rochester, 
The Fisher brothers also designed the George Flummerfelt House on the corner of 4th and Walnut, which we know as the Potier Modette's funeral home. And they were the designers of the Harris Fountain, which stands by the municipal building. The construction of this new high school inspired other building activity in the village. Developers platted residential lots west of the school property in what they formally named the New School Subdivision. The residential lots ranged in price from $75 to $200 each and all sold out within a week of the sale announcement. And a building boom near the school property was launched. So if you live on Fairview and Helen and parts of Castell in that area and when you get your tax bill every year it says new school subdivision on it, this is why. Rochester residents may have been justifiably proud of their new school, but once again, the building was quickly shown to be insufficient to meet student needs. Within three years of this building opening, the local newspaper reported a critical lack of available seating in the high school. Rochester experienced a growth spurt following World War I, and the village population increased by 68% between 1910 and 1920. Growth elsewhere in Avon Township, whose rural primary schools were also sending their high school students to Avon Number 5, increased the pressure on the district to expand its high school capacity. In addition, a state law was passed in 1919 that required districts serving populations of more than 3,000 to provide the necessary teachers, facilities, and equipment for a physical education course of instruction. Since Avon Township had already surpassed that benchmark and Rochester was running up on it fast, Avon Number 5 was compelled to address the deficit in their curriculum. So they built again. In, 1920, uh, in 1920, construction of a new gymnasium wing for the high school got underway. You can see the original building right here this is the gymnasium wing that was built in 1920. Then there's some open space here, and right there we can see the very north end of the Harrison Building. You can see that again. Here is the Harrison Building. Here is the gym addition, and here is the original high school. And you notice that the gymnasium addition doubled the size of the high school three years after it was open. The addition featured a multi-purpose gymnasium and auditorium that had a stage, a balcony with an inclined running track and locker rooms and shower rooms to comply with the state law. And the new wing also added six classrooms. This new gymnasium hosted its first basketball game in January 1921, so 101 years ago. Back when the original high school construction had been underway for this portion right here, an interesting newspaper item popped up in the Utica Sentinel. The Sentinel reported on May 5, 1916, quote, workmen while excavating for the basement of the new Rochester High School came upon a curiosity in the form of a cave which extended 12 feet back into the bank, about 12 feet below the surface of the ground, end quote. That's all they said. No other details, no follow-up, nothing. That was the whole, whole story. But when they began to excavate four years later for the gymnasium, the Rochester era chimed in with this quote, another cave similar to the one found when the high school building was built was found during the excavation work last week. It is supposed that it is one of the branches of the larger cave which is told of by the older inhabitants of Rochester. Again, no more details and Try as I might, I can't find out what the older inhabitants of Rochester were talking about. But there it is. They found something both times when they excavated for that school. Well, the addition of the gym did relieve high school overcrowding for a little while. Rochester and Avon Township continued to see population increases during the 1920s, fueled in part by the subdivision of the former farmlands in Avon that were providing housing for workers who uh, had been in the, employed in the 
auto factories of Detroit and Pontiac. By 1927, some classes were operating in half-day sessions, so the voters approved a bond in October of that year to add on to the high school yet again. The school board awarded contracts in March 1928 for an addition that would include 16 new classrooms. This addition, built in 1928-29, was designed to run east and west. You can see it right there on the Sanborn map. Between the gym addition and the old 1889 building, so that it effectively united the campus in one giant kind of Z-shaped building. The addition was complete by January of 1929. The architect on this project was Edward A. Schilling of the Detroit firm of Van Leyen, Schilling & Keith. Schilling and Van Leyen had become partners in 1900. They designed the Belle Isle Casino, the Flint, Michigan City Hall, and more than 220 school buildings in Michigan, Ohio, and Ontario. Now here is an aerial view of the campus that will show us a little bit more of how everything fits together. First we have the 1889 building with its 1907 addition. Then we have the 1916 high school, the 1920 gymnasium addition, and then finally the 1928-29 addition. And that created the more or less the campus that we have today. During the Great Depression, the Board of Education renovated and refurbished its buildings through federal work programs. The remodeling of the 1889 building involved removing the bell tower and reconfiguring the classrooms. At that time, the old building, which was still serving as an elementary school, was named to honor a beloved custodian who had been caring for the school since 1897. The Board of Education named it the William F. Harrison School. Harrison was especially dear to students, as student Della Casey Wilson noted in this 1928 tribute, quoting now, it was Bill who rang the bell until the last straggling youngster could make the run up the hill and land breathless in his seat without being tardy. In the winter time when the back hill was icy, it was Bill who knew where the old worn out scoop shovel could be found for just one more slide down the hill. He knows the age and life history of each and every student who ever came here to school. The citizens of 35 or 40 years of age have all been under his guidance, and because none have happened to reach the Senate or the President's chair, it is not Bill's fault, for he has wished them all well." End quote. For the first time in its history, the school board had named a school in honor of a single individual. Harrison continued to serve the school until 1942 when he retired at the age of 80 after 45 years of service. Upon his retirement, the school board honored him with a tribute which said in part, a trusted and loyal employee is the finest asset any institution may enjoy. Public schools where parents send their choicest possessions, their children, are honored by the faithful labor of good men and women such a man was William Harrison. 45 years is a long time. 45 years and not an unkind word can be recalled by those who knew him. To William Harrison achieved a character attained by few men. May his name be forever hallowed and enshrined in the building named for him. And that is why we call this section the Harrison Building. In addition to remodeling the school through New Deal funding, the school board commissioned two substantial pieces of artwork through the Federal Art Project program. Sculptor Leonard Youngworth, the creator of the Sparty statue at MSU, among many other works, created a bas-relief mural for the high school library. This slide shows the mural in its original location in the library. It's kind of hard to see, but it's right here above the bookcase and shows it in its current location. This is what it looks like today, located in the Harrison Room of the Administration Building. Marvin Beerbohm painted a mural entitled Industrial Environment of Rochester High School over one of the building's stairwells. That is a view at the top there. 
The mural was covered over with drywall during a remodeling of the building in the 1960s, but it was rediscovered in 1990 when that uh, drywall was taken down and it was put into storage. In 2011, the Rochester Avon Historical Society unveiled the restored work of art after leading a two-year effort to save the damaged mural. Both the Youngworth and Beerbohm murals currently occupy places of honor in the administration center's boardroom. And you can see um, on the bottom there is the photograph of the restored mural hanging in what is the former gymnasium. After World War II, Avon District No. 5 began looking at the possibility of consolidating with some of the outlying rural districts of the township. All of these schools were already sending their students to Avon No. 5 for high school. Now consolidation happened in two waves, the first one in 1949 and the second one in 1953. This map shows, again, the original borders of Avon No. 5 in the magenta, and then the green line shows what the school district's borders were after the 1949 consolidation. They went from a school district that covered about four and a half miles geographically to covering over 18 miles geographically. And then when the second wave of consolidation happened in 1953, that is the blue line, uh, but that also extended into Oakland Township, Shelby Township, and Washington Township, and that's why I've got these blue arrows up here, because this map only shows Avon Township, so you can only see about half of the district depicted here after the second consolidation. That was 61.6 .6 square miles, so in a five-year period, they went from a four and a half mile district to a district that was serving over 61 square miles. After the first consolidation in 1949, the school board said, well, we can't call ourselves Avon District Number no. 5 anymore because we're not, we need a new name. So they chose Rochester Community School District as the new name, and today we just abbreviate that as RCS. In the post-war era, consolidation as well as subdivision development in Avon Township meant that the school district's enrollment was expanding exponentially. The district desperately needed new schools, and its campus at 4th and Wilcox was not large enough to house the high school any longer, not with a district that covered over 61 square miles. So by the mid-1950s, a very ambitious building program was underway and a new Rochester High School was taking shape at the corner of Walton and Livernois. When the new Rochester High School received its students for the first time on October 31st, 1956, the move signaled a huge change for the historic campus in town. There would be no high school students on Academy Hill for the first time since 1882. This photo was taken on the day that the students moved to the new high school. They cleaned out their lockers in the old building. They all lined up on Wilcox, and you can see them right here stacked up. And then they turned the corner following the marching band out onto Fifth Street or University Drive, as it's called now, and they marched themselves out to Walton and Livernois and put their books in their new lockers and, and started their new school. So although Rochester High had left the building, the schoolhouse on Academy Hill was still serving as the home of the district's junior high school, and the Harrison Building was still an active elementary school. When the district unveiled plans in 1960 for a second junior high school building to be located in the western section of the district and to be named West Junior High, the one in town was then christened Central Junior High. Elementary school students left the historic campus after the 1960-61 school year when the new McGregor Elementary School opened a few blocks away. At the time, the, uh, some administrative offices then took over the Harrison Building. Meanwhile, Central Junior High School continued to operate until the early 1970s, at which time Ruther and Van Hoosen Junior High Schools were under construction. 
Central hosted the students who were destined for Ruther and Van Hoosen until their new buildings opened. And in the spring of 1973, the last students left the RCS historic campus. After the closure of Central Junior High, the district began to consolidate its various administrative functions at the historic campus. By 1980, the question of whether the building could continue to serve as an administrative center into the future was under discussion. The school board decided to look at other options, an action which brought about this headline in January of 1980. Now remember, this is from 42 years ago, not from yesterday. The story contains a very interesting little side and a window into the building's history. At the time that this was written, the superintendent of schools was Edwin Crandall, and his office was in the Harrison Building. The reporter notes that some work being done in Crandall's office led to a discovery. So quoting from the story, just last weekend, when workers were doing some renovating in Crandall's office, a message from Harrison was found. Workers were taking down a blackboard and discovered another one behind it. Written faintly in the upper left-hand corner of the hidden slate was the note, W. Harrison, January 28, 1923. Weather was cold and raining. The fate of the historic campus was batted about for a couple of years, and finally, rejecting the option of selling the property, the board placed an $18 million bond issue before voters in September 1988. This bond issue set aside $3 million for the repair and rehabilitation of the administrative center, and the question was approved by 71% of the voters. The work completed in 1989-90 involved creating a new main entry pavilion on University Drive and a smaller one on the northwest corner of the Harrison Building. And it also included building-wide asbestos abatement, the addition of an elevator, the introduction of carpeting, dropped ceilings, and textured wallboard in much of the building. The former gymnasium was repurposed as a meeting room and christened the Harrison Room and it serves as the Board of Education meeting space today. The Youngworth mural was moved to the former gymnasium at this time, and the Beerbaum mural was placed in storage and largely forgotten until the Rochester Avon Historical Society sponsored its restoration two decades later and unveiled it in the Harrison Room in 2011. Based on its historical associations with the people of Rochester, its history as a site of an educational institution since 1847, and the building's significance as an early design of noted architect Claire Allen, the 1889 schoolhouse, also known as the Harrison Building, was listed on the Michigan State Register of Historic Sites in September 1987. Now in 2022, another chapter in the history of the campus is about to unfold. RCS will vacate the historic campus in the coming months, bringing to close 175 years of educated related use of Academy Hill. The fate of this building is at this point uncertain and it is most definitely in peril of demolition. The question of how the Board of Education and the community will exercise their stewardship of this cultural and historical asset remains an open one. We hope for the best. Any questions, comments, or discussion? The Planning Commission in Rochester met last night, and I called in this question. So far, according to the Commission, the city, um, Council or the Planning Commission has not been approached by any individual or company to tear down the houses. That sounds about right to me because the bids uh, from the RFP were just recently opened and the school board hasn't taken any uh, action on them yet. So at this point, the property has not been sold to anyone and there's nothing happening. The question is, are they going to accept one of those proposals? And if so, which one? 
Some of them call for full or partial uh, preservation of the building, and at least one of them calls for total uh, demolition. So th where it's hanging right now is with the school board and what they choose to do. Yes. I've read uh, books about uh, aunties and sisters and how the parents get sent them to the White Sea and the full life that they were a friend of them, so they ship them off to Pontiac to go to school. Could that possibly be why the White Sea and decided to um, close because they weren't, they weren't getting accreditation uh, to know that. Well, that certainly seems like a possibility to me. I know Calvin Green, who was the last headmaster there, was not, as far as I know, uh, a college-educated man. When they started the Lyceum, they were using college-educated headmasters and credentialed teachers, but perhaps they couldn't sustain that going forward. I don't know. Like I said, as far as we know, there aren't any existing records, no minutes, no anything like that, uh, that would tell us what was going on with the school. And because we don't have any local newspaper from that era, there's very little to know other than the few public records that remain, like the transfer of the deeds. Yes? Since it has not yet been decided by the Board of Education, I would urge any of you who have feelings to communicate to the Board of Education through the Board of Education website, not through the Rochester Community Schools website. But they're still not, you know, they're still thinking. And so perhaps if more and more people have a feeling of preservation, uh, there might still be room for some change. Former student at Central Junior High, and then as a teacher and an employee in Rochester Schools, I had an office in that building for 12 years. Um, I'm greatly sad to think I can turn down. And as your program described, and in my knowledge of how schools work, every building decision had a bond issue or a vote from the voters. This did not. Is that correct? There was no vote. No, we weren't asked to vote on whether they would vacate that building. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. and they haven't spent any money on here. I was told that the last uh, sinking fund bond purposely said, well, not purposely, but it said that no money was to be spent unless it directly affected. And that's why they claim they haven't done anything to the building in 30 years. Do you know if the historical society has, if they do save pieces of the building, is the historical society having the thoughts on it? Can you go and bring it to stay? I cannot speak for the Historical Society Board of Directors. I can only tell you that they passed a resolution a couple of months ago in support of the historic preservation of the building. They would like to see it continue to stand, and they have been working hard to rally support from other stakeholders in the community to do the same. Some of them have um, Rochester City Council passed a resolution, Oakland County, Oakland Township passed a resolution. Um, so the Rochester Avon Historical Society, if you watch in the newspapers, has been rallying the troops as best they can. Thank you, Janet. Um, at a minimum, we would insist that the two murals that, that we talked about would be safe, and ideally, we'd like to see them in a public location would be the library rather than move to the new administration building way on the other side of town and maybe it's everyone to see them. So you know, we're really, basically, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, 
So at a minimum, we would have just done that. But obviously, we are hopeful. And as Jim just said, please um, raise your voices. Some of them mentioned that there's no public input. Other communities have had town halls and solicited input from the community. This was done very much kind of under the behind closed doors and in a secure way. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your attention.